Then um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor um, Anya Jabor. Anya Jabor is a professor of history in the history department and past co-director of the Women's and Gender Studies program at uh, University of Montana. She teaches courses in US women's history, family history, and Southern history, as well as several upper division writing courses, and was the 2001 recipient of the Ellen and Winston Cox Award for Excellence in Teaching. She is author of books and articles on these themes and on the history of women's education. She is currently working on a biography of educator and, and activist Sophonia Preston Breckenridge. And uh, Sophonia Breckridge, Assistant Dean of Women, is one of the protagonists of her paper titled Separatism and Equality, Women at University of Chicago. Mm, please, Professor Jabo, 20 minutes, please. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank uh, the conference organizers for allowing me to be here. Um, it's very exciting because, as, um, as was just indicated, this work today is part of a larger project that is a biography of a pioneering educator in the field of social work in the United States. And in the larger work, a lot of the same themes that we've already heard about uh, emerge. Um, so it's uh, exciting to hear about them in comparative context. Um, so although I won't talk about this in detail today, my larger project includes Breckenridge's work with the International Association of Schools of Social Work, which brought her into contact with numerous uh, European educators, including um, Alice Salomon, who was exiled from Germany uh, during the Nazi regime. Um, and my larger project also addresses Breckenridge's promotion of social work, and in particular, her view of social science as the basis for social policy. Uh, so that, of course, ties in with this theme of the role of the modern research university and society. But today, I'm going to focus on more sort of personal and social history aspects of the story, um, although it will tie into some of those themes of inclusion and exclusion, especially with respect to gender. OK, so what I want to do today is focus on women students at the University of Chicago during uh, the tenure of Marianne Talbot as Dean of Women and Sophie Nisba Breckenridge as Assistant Dean of Women. For 30 years, from Breckenridge's arrival on campus in, 1920, in excuse me, 1895 until Talbot's retirement in 1925, the two women together, Breckenridge and Talbot, promoted women's educational equality and protected women's separate space at the University of Chicago. So the opening decades of the 20th century witnessed the rise of co-education as the dominant model of higher education in the US, Canada, and the UK. Yet as the scholar Marianne Zupak points out, whether in single sex or co-educational settings, gender remained a central issue in higher education. Thus, uh, my paper today emphasizes the ways in which separatism and equality were mutually reinforcing at the University of Chicago and together allowed women to reap the benefits of co-education without running the gauntlet of second class status. So two major challenges to women's full participation in campus life on many co-educational campuses were men's hostility to the female students who they insisted on calling co-eds, um, and parents' concerns about feminine modesty. As at other co-educational schools at the University of Chicago, male edited student publications became an outlet for men to express their ambiguous and sometimes outright hostile attitudes toward women students. <clears throat> As you can see here, in the University of Chicago's yearbook called The Cap and Gown, depictions of women as scholars were consistently negative, ridiculing the class know-it-all, 
uh, who wore spectacles and monopolized the library. Men's contributions to the cap and gown suggested that they regarded co-education as desirable only insofar as it provided opportunities for heterosexual romance. So the message was that women on campus, uh, unless they were cute co-eds who were amenable to men's advances, were unwelcome interlopers. However, Breckenridge and Talbot were immune to these criticisms and made women students' academic lives the centerpiece of their work. They proposed that every woman student should prepare herself to become, as they said, as efficient as possible a human being, a citizen, and an expert. So these guidelines, uh, which focused on women as citizens and as scholars, encouraged female students to think of themselves as serious scholars equal to men. Countering the image of female collegians as co-eds, Talbot also insisted on referring to them as the university woman. Uh, so there's a contrast there. In the opening decades of the 20th century, Co-education still seemed to be a dangerous experiment to many observers, and therefore many schools imposed very restrictive rules about male-female interaction, including women-only curfews and very complicated student conduct codes that dictated when, where, and how closely to one another male and female students could interact. In sharp contrast to their counterparts at other co-educational institutions, however, <clears throat> Breckenridge and Talbot imposed very few rules and they applied them to both male and female students rather than only to female students as was often the case. Before Breckenridge had arrived at the University of Chicago, her former mentor at Wellesley College, Alice Freeman Palmer, had played an important role in establishing a place for women on campus as the university's first dean of women. With assistant Dean Marion Talbot, Palmer established residence halls for women students and pressured the president to appoint women faculty. Thanks to Palmer and Talbot, the University of Chicago was at the forefront of a national movement to professionalize women's administrative positions paving the way for female administrators to advocate for women rather than to supervise their behavior. So following Palmer's departure and her own promotion to Dean of Women, one of the ways that Talbot advanced women's status on campus was to secure fellowships for women interested in graduate study. And one of these was Sylphanisba Breckenridge, who came to the University of Chicago in 1895. To help Breckenridge finance her education, Talbot hired her as her assistant in the office of the Dean of Women and in the women's residence halls. She also helped her to secure a fellowship in political science. After Breckenridge earned her master's degree in political science in 1897, her PhD in political economy in 1901, and finally her Juris Doctorate in 1904, she proved unable to attain a faculty position in any of her fields of expertise. So Talbot helped her secure a part-time teaching position in a new department, the Department of Household Administration, which Talbot founded and chaired. She also finagled her appointment as Assistant Dean of Women. And it was in this role that Breckenridge and Talbot worked together to advance women's equality and protect women's separate space at the University of Chicago. One of the most important elements of promoting women's status at the University of Chicago was what was known as the house system. Most coeducational institutions eventually provided some kind of residential accommodations for women students. But the house system at the University of Chicago went well beyond merely providing housing for women students. Instead, the women's residence halls fostered group identity and self-government within an all-female space. Dormitory friendships and activities were an important part of the University of Chicago students' lives. One resident of Green Hall, which was the women's residence hall that Breckenridge supervised, 
uh, kept a photograph album of residential life in 1899 to 1900. In a series of pictures taken in and around Green Hall, she documented both daily life and special occasions. Some photos featured bathroom-clad students on their way to the communal bathrooms, holding dress-up parties, such as a Japanese tea party, <clears throat> and engaging in a vigorous snowball fight. <clears throat> Others showed students either singly or in pairs, quietly mending clothing or reading books in their rooms. Yet another depicted a group of students piled on and near a room's single bed, enjoying homemade fudge, fudge parties being a major theme of dormitory life. Several documented amateur theatricals, with women taking on both male and female roles, and apparently poking fun at misunderstandings between the sexes. So dormitory life on a coeducational campus allowed women to create a female community similar to that at women's colleges. Indeed, one historian has dubbed the University of Chicago a Western Wellesley. But the most unique aspect of the house system was the way in which it fostered self-government. Under the house system, residents of each hall drew up constitutions elected officers, voted on new memberships, and assumed responsibility for enforcing whatever rules the current house, meaning the members, agreed upon. And there were remarkably few rules, particularly in comparison to other institutions in the US, Great Britain, and Canada. <clears throat> Talbot intended to promote personal freedom, limited only by what she called intelligent choice, consideration for others, and a determination on the part of each to choose a path not only worthy of the university, but conforming to one's best ideas. In practice, what this meant was that students themselves should agree on what activities might interfere with the rights of others or be a source of discomfort for others and form their guidelines accordingly. Self-government was strikingly successful in the women's residences at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> Although the university president periodically expressed concern about anonymous and usually unverified complaints about female students' behavior, including dancing the tango, women students consistently responded by reaffirming their commitment to self-government. One greenhouse member explained, there's a genuine group feeling which demands mutuality of comfort and convenience and privileges. There are no proctors, no rules, no paternalism upon which one may shift the responsibility. It is ours, and we accept it and make the most and the best of it. In part because of her commitment to the house system, Dean Talbot was opposed to the exclusive sorority system. Instead, admission standards for women's clubs at the University of Chicago had to be unrestrictive and based on the club's purpose between 1900 and 1925, most women's clubs were dedicated to social, literary, or educational purposes. A few were explicitly devoted to reform and politics, such as the Equal Suffrage Association. By sponsoring and guiding women's clubs with democratic membership rules, Talbot and Breckenridge attempted to ensure that all women on campus had equal access to social opportunities. Women's clubs were extremely popular at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> and the male contributors to the cap and gown were really quite uncomfortable with this. <laughs> male contributors to the yearbook were baffled at women's commitment to club work, which limited their availability to as romantic interests. Clubs almost always met on Monday evenings, and that meant that men could not get a date on Monday nights. So you can see this cartoon on campus types included the club girl, who supposedly roamed campus to recruit new images, or to recruit new students, sorry. This image uh, depicted two rather stern figures in the foreground, with another person described as a disdainful person in the background. 
The caption read, that is a mortar board, the person in the background. Uh, or maybe it is Dean Talbot. At this distance, it is hard to tell which. So the cap and gown depicted club members as unattractive and overly serious. <clears throat> a 1918 contribution to the cap and gown titled Snubbing the Women's Clubs criticized each of the clubs in turn, but the esoteric club pictured here received special attention. The esoteric club was a social club, um, but according to the cap and gown, um, it was a uh, a group of fuddy-duddies who followed the guidelines established by the deans of women and produced blue-stocking spinsters. According to the cap and gown, Breckenridge says they're the best on campus. But aside from that, it is said to be a campus organization duly registered at the dean's office and meeting regularly on Monday nights. As a rule, its members are highly moral respectable young women, capable of furnishing satisfactory family shrubbery and scholastic records. We would advise any mother's daughter to immediately don the scotch cap, the rimmed spectacles, and the flat shoes upon entering college, for such is the shortcut to membership in the esoteric. The cap and gowns depiction of the esoteric club as a group of stuffy scholars with no sense of fun, contrasts with snapshots of club members collected in a student's scrapbook. With their shirt sleeves rolled up to their elbows, the young women in this photo seized paddles and skimmed across the Rock River in the small town of Oregon, Illinois, south of Chicago. There are many pictures of club members at the seashore. In this one, women donned bathing costumes uh, that were no doubt cumbersome with their full bloomers and puff sleeves, but also did not prevent them from swimming or boating. Photographs of the esoteric club also show club members holding mixed gender gatherings. One, for instance, depicts club members seated on the grass beneath a tree, enjoying a picnic with male friends. Another documents a softball game in progress. And still another documents an esoteric house party in Lakeside, Michigan. Although both men and women attended these events, there were female chaperones, and women also continued to engage in single sex as well as mixed gender activities. Another photo from Lakeside, which is pictured here, shows a group of young women uh, with their arms flung about each other's shoulders who identified themselves as the eating eight. Another image from a waterfront picnic shows two women seated together holding hands, while behind them a mixed gender group gathers in a rowboat. Men and women also interacted very casually with one another. For instance, this picture shows a man and a woman building a sandcastle together. <clears throat> At the same time, however, some women clearly preferred one another's company. One series of photos repeatedly depicts two women holding hands and gazing into one another's eyes. Another shows three nightgown-clad young women having a slumber party. And yet another shows a group of women laughing at the sight of one attempting to ride another piggyback. As in women's residences, the esoteric club enjoyed amateur theatricals and held all women dances, as well as other single sex gatherings. So with lighthearted good times like these, it's not surprising that despite men's criticisms, college women continued to devote time and energy to their clubs. In addition to promoting student self-government and women's clubs, Deans Talbot and Breckenridge also sought to promote unity and equality by offering social opportunities to all women affiliated with the university, including those who resided off campus. This was especially important because the university's residence halls could only accommodate one-third of those who requested space. 
The high point of the campaign to establish women's space open to all was the creation of the first non-residential building for women, Ida B. Noyes Hall. One of the ways that the University of Chicago fell short of its promise for, of education for women on equal terms with men, as was stated in the charter, was in its athletic facilities, or lack thereof. Like many other co-educational institutions, the University of Chicago initially made only very stingy provisions for women's athletics. Women's opportunities for social interaction also lagged behind men's, as male alumni endowed the school with buildings, such as the Reynolds Club and the Hutchinson Commons, which functioned as men's clubs and excluded women. Chicago's women finally attained their long-standing goal of a women's building dedicated to social and athletic activities when the industrialist Laverne Noyes donated funds for a women's club building in memory of his late wife, Ida B. Noyes. Noyes Hall, pictured here, was a highly visible and permanent marker of women's inclusion at the University of Chicago. In addition to providing facilities for athletics, including playing fields, a swimming pool, and a billiard room, Noyes Hall also provided a cafeteria and dining room. This was important because, again, the men's eating halls excluded women. Noyes Hall also provided a reading room and a space for clubs to meet. This is the uh, Young Women's Christian Association room. The building also provided a space for gender integrated social gatherings, which were held, of course, under the supervision of the Dean of Women. Like her counterparts at other universities, Dean Talbot was in charge of women's social lives, but unlike at most schools, Talbot had authority over all social gatherings. <clears throat> As the cap and gown put it, Riley, man proposes, but Dean Talbot disposes. Because Talbot regulated all social activities, not just women's behavior, she helped to shape a code of student conduct at the University of Chicago that differed markedly from that at other co-educational campuses where women's lives were hemmed in by restrictive rules and men developed a hedonistic subculture. Thus, Dean Talbot helped create an atmosphere in which women, not men, were the standard. Rather than female co-eds adapting to men's campus, men had to adapt to women's code of behavior. Much as men on campus might deride Dean Talbot's policies and prefer all-male settings, such as the men's eating halls, if they wished to interact with college women at all, they had no choice but to abide by her guidelines and adapt to the atmosphere of women's face. By enforcing a common code of conduct on men and women, then, separate facilities promoted gender equality. Between 1895 and 1925, Breckenridge and Talbot's joint administration helped make the University of Chicago far more hospitable to women students than other co-educational universities, where the lack of a female sub-community combined with a rowdy male subculture to make women students outcasts rather than equals. Thanks to Talbot and Breckenridge, early women students at the University of Chicago enjoyed both equal opportunity and women's community. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Jabour, uh, for your speech uh, on uh, women's status at the University of Chicago. Uh, 